The scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. Please stand as we read this morning. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. The Lord says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for this time that we have to come together this morning and study your word together. We thank you, Father, for the freedom and privilege to do so. Uh, We thank you, Father, that you have adopted us into your family as your children, and not only so, but have indwelled us with the Holy Spirit of God to give us insight and clarity into the spiritual things of life and the power to take words from the page and put them into practice in our life. And we just pray, Father, once more as we are gathered here that we'll allow the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, direct, to be in control in our lives, to give us reactions that you would have us to, to react to in our life and the way that you would have us react rather than reacting in the power of our own flesh. It's in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Stories told of a uh, woman who for many years couldn't sleep at night. She had, she had difficulty sleeping at night. And the reason was because she would lay there in bed and she would worry about all kinds of things. Um, one of the things she worried about was that somebody would rob them during the night while they were sleeping. Well, lo and behold, one night there were some noises downstairs and the husband gets up to go investigate. And sure enough, there's a man standing right there in the living room who had come to rob them. And the man says, hey, listen, will you please come upstairs and meet my wife? She's been waiting 10 years to meet <laughs> No, 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 that, that wouldn't be our reaction. But it's an illustration of how, you know, a burglar can steal from you one time. Somebody, a thief can steal from you one time. But worry steals from you day after day, night after night. Worry, fear, they're thieves that steal from us. And we're going to see that as we progress in our study today. This is our third lesson in the series of Fear not. And the first week we talked about the difference between a healthy fear and unhealthy fear. We know that God has not given us a spirit of fear that is an unhealthy fear, but has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The second week, last week, we looked a little further into this idea of a sound mind or uh, also rendered self-control. We talked about the form of fear called worry and that we need to, to control that fear in our life by turning it over to God. Just leave things in God's hands and not worry so much about everything. Today, we're going a little further down that road of worry, talking about a specific worry, and that's the worry of the things in the future. The followers of Jesus Christ are are called to put away the worry of the future, to just focus on today. In our opening verse this morning, the Lord said, don't worry about tomorrow. So then what does that leave us with? It just leaves us with today. The Lord said, tomorrow, you know, that that's tomorrow. Let it be tomorrow. Don't think about the things of tomorrow. Sufficient for the day uh, is its own trouble. Uh, it allows us to be focused on today, to be in the present, to deal appropriately with circumstances in our life that come up. We read this pass. Uh, excuse me. We read in the passage last week this passage, but we're going to take a moment to look a little further at the words here uh, in the context of Matthew chapter six. And as we're doing so, I want you to focus on one thing that's here in this passage. I want you to see the value that God places upon us, upon you specifically. Take it personal. The word of God is written to you as a believer, as a child of God. And so, as we're reading this passage, think of yourself. And take it personal of the value that God places upon you. Let's start reading with Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 25. The Lord says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Uh, Some kind of uh, bit of controversy there as to whether the language is talking about adding heights or if it's talking about adding length to your days of life. Uh, But... But either way, by worrying, which can you do? I mean, the point there in verse 27 is that your worrying is useless. Your worrying contributes nothing to the situation. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed 
and as like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I think we get the notion sometimes that God may not really care about us. Right? It's okay. We can admit it. We live in these bodies of flesh that are... Weak and frail and fickle and we're tossed this way and that. That's the nature of our flesh. It's the nature of the conflict that takes place within us, even as children of God. Even though we have the Spirit of God indwelling within us, we still have this conflict, this battle that takes place that Paul presented so clearly in Romans chapter 7. But we have to be careful not to give in to those fears, not to give in to the power of the flesh. God does care about us. God places great value Upon us, upon you, again, take it personal. I mean, just think about it, that God places such a great value upon you that he sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary for us. For the purpose of being able to spend eternity with you. That's how much God loves you. That's what a great value that God the Father places upon us, that he wants to spend eternity with us. The Father doesn't want you wasting one second of this precious short little time here that you have in this life worrying about things, especially worrying about things of the future. Sometimes people are paralyzed by an unhealthy fear through this worry. They become crippled by anxiety and doubt. And unfortunately, it's even true of Christians that give in to that same thing. But God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to come to him. He is willing to take it all on. He wants us to place it all in his hands. If you remember back to last week's sermon, that was the secret that Paul said that he had learned about being content in all things, that he turned it over to God. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter said, cast all your cares upon him. Why? For he cares for you. God cares for us. He loves us. He wants us to come to him with everything. And that's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 last week. Let's look at that passage briefly. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. We'll read verses 6 and 7. It was our passage for last week. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And Jesus says here, as recorded in the book of Matthew, as we read this morning, that we don't need to worry. It's a waste of our time and energy. It accomplishes nothing. But we can be such fearful creatures. But listen, we serve the creator of the universe who cares, who loves us, who calls us his own. Uh, It's said that there's 365 times in the scriptures that you can find the words fear not. One for every day of the week. I mean, how ironic is it that God gives us a scripture for every day of the week for us to fear not, to not be afraid Because he is with us. Because he values us so highly. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1, here's one of the passages. It says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Spoken to Jacob, the Israelites, the descendants of of Jacob, descendants of Abraham. But it's just as true for us today. As members of the family of God and the body of Christ, God has called us. We, we are his. We belong to him. He's redeemed us. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
God wants to do that for us. Don't be afraid. Instead, turn to him. He says, I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I, I don't want to look at all of these fear nots this morning. Instead, I want to do something just a little bit different. Um, hopefully a little bit fun for us this morning. I want us to look at God's victories in the scriptures. Uh, I want us to see the ways that, that God did help. I want us to see the ways that God did fight for his people in the past. For many of you, the stories are all familiar and you know them all. I, I hope you don't get bored as we look back at them and you say, I already know this. I already knew this story. I hope that's never our attitude Toward the word of God. For some, maybe there may be one or two in here that you didn't know of, that you, or, or maybe that you've forgotten that we're going to bring back to your memory this morning. That's what Bible study is about. For us to look at these things, examine them, take Scripture as a whole, and understand the God that we serve and what He is capable of doing, the victories that He is able to win. In Genesis chapter 14, Abraham wins a victory there. It's when we're not going to turn to all of these. I'm just going to summarize them for you. You can take notes. You can go back and look at them later. And that's why I didn't give specific uh, verses on the outline this morning for the overhead. I have some specific verses that I'm going to reference. But I gave you the chapter so you can go back and you can look at these if you want to read the whole context of them. But in Genesis chapter 14, it's when five kings get together and they... They sack Sodom and Gomorrah, and in the process of doing so, Lot and his family are taken captive. Remember, that is Abraham's nephew. And Abraham hears of it, and Abraham gathers together his men, and he goes out to go take the victory over these kings and free Lot. And Abraham does it with just over a hundred men. Abraham catches up to the alliance of five kings and their armies and defeats them to free Lot. Now, how is that possible that Abraham, with just over a hundred men, was able to win such a victory? Well, we know how it's possible. In verse 20, we see that uh, Melchizedek comes out and he meets Abraham. And Melchizedek tells Abraham that God has delivered Abraham's enemies into his hand. And we know that's true. We know that that's why Abraham was able to win that victory. is because God won the victory for him. In Exodus, oh, we all know the story of the Exodus, right? What is the Exodus about? It's about them being held, about the Hebrew people being held captive in Egypt and becoming slaves there. And they are freed from that. But as they are freed, they come up to the bank of the Red Sea and what? They're standing there. There's nowhere to go. Pharaoh's army now is pursuing them because Pharaoh's changed his mind once again. And now he's brought uh, the force of all his army to come bear against the Hebrew people. Probably to kill many of them and take what he can back captive once again. But what happens there? God parts the Red Sea. The Hebrews walk across on what? dry ground and they get to the other side and Pharaoh and his armies pursue into the Red Sea and what happens there? The sea closes up, swallows them up. They all drown. When they get to that bank in Exodus chapter 14 verses 13 and 14 Moses tells them not to be afraid. Moses tells them God will fight for them and deliver them. And we see that that's exactly what happened. In verses 23 through 28 is where the Egyptians pursue as they get into the dry ground on the Red Sea. In fact, their chariots and wagons and things start to fall apart. Wheels start to fall off. So they're stranded there and then the sea rushes in and kills them. And then verses 30 and 31 gives us a summary of how God fought for them and won that victory for them. Joshua chapter 6. How many of you are familiar with the Battle of Jericho? It wasn't really much of a battle. Was it? I mean, it was a fortified city that they came to. And God told Joshua, every day for six days, walk around the city one time in silence. Walk around the city one time and then leave it at that. Can you imagine the people inside? And they walk around and in complete silence and they leave. And they do this every day for six days. But on the seventh day, they walked around the city seven times. 
And when they finished, after the seventh time, they yelled and screamed and blew trumpets, and the walls of the city fell. And they were able to take the city of Jericho without a single life being lost from the Hebrew people. How miraculous is that? Before any of that happened, though, in Joshua chapter 6, in verse 2, God said he had already given them the city. It was already done. Seven days before it happened, God said, I've already given you the city. It's already yours. The victory has already been won. In Judges chapter 7, Gideon is called to fight for the Hebrew people against the Midianites. Midianites had oppressed them for some number of years. And Gideon is called by God. At first, I mean, if you go back before that, Gideon was real apprehensive when God called him to lead uh, the Israelites to this victory. Because he said, you know, I'm the smallest, I'm the youngest, I'm the weakest of my brethren, but this is who God chose. And not only did God choose him, when Gideon started gathering the forces and all the people came out that were ready to go to battle to free them from the oppression of the Midianites, God said, this is too many people. Lest Israel say that they won the victory by their own hand. And so God whittled it down and whittled it down until it was how many people? How many of you know from the story? 300. Until it was only 300 men of battle against all the host of the Midianites. 300. Then when they went into battle and they blew the trumpets, in verse 22, it says, The Midianites were so confused and confounded by everything that was happening, they were killing each other. The Israelites didn't even have to worry about the battle because the Midianites started fighting each other and were killing each other. But then they pursued them. They won the victory. Only 300 against the host of the Midianites. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Philistines are battling against Israel at this time. And then Samuel takes the Israelites into battle. And a very similar thing happened there. In verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 7, the, the Philistines started fighting amongst themselves because they were so confused in battle. Of course, God caused that to happen. Saul led an offensive against the Philistines once more a few chapters later in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 14, the exact same thing happened again. The Philistines were fighting each other because they were so confused in the battle. In 2 Kings chapter 19, the Assyrians come up against Israel. At that time, their king was named Hezekiah. And the leader of the opposing forces was Sennacherib. How many of you know this story? Sennacherib's hosts came and camped out against Israel. And there was supposed to be a battle the next day, but it never happened. Why? Because the night before the battle, the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians. And 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers didn't wake up the next morning. God killed 185,000 of them in their sleep so that the next morning, Sennacherib, with what forces remained, retreated. And once again, Israel was given the victory as God fought for them. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat is leading an offensive against the Moabites who had formed an alliance with the Amorites and the inhabitants of Mount Seir who were coming in and they were raiding Israel. They were doing all kinds of damage. And so Jehoshaphat has had enough and he gathers forces, of course, with the Lord to go into battle against the Moabites. And the people of Israel are told again that the battle has already been won for them. And so the day that they get ready to march into battle in verse, verses 22, 23, 24 of Second Chronicles chapter 20, as they go to march in on the battlefield, they find that for whatever reason, we're not told the reason that this happened, but there arose some kind of disagreement between the Moabites and the Ammonites and those of Mount Seir when they gathered together to battle against Israel, that they started fighting against each other. 
before the battle with Israel ever began. And when Israel went to march into battle on that day, there was no battle because there were just dead bodies laying everywhere. They didn't even have to fight for the spoil. They just had to walk around and pick it up. Everybody was already dead. Battles that our God is able to win. Over and over and over. Listen, this is not all of them. This is what our God is able to do. What about when it's individuals? What about when it's not armies? Well, we have the story in Daniel chapter 3. You remember what happened there? Where Nebuchadnezzar made the image and he said, from now on, you're not to pray to anybody. You're to bow down before this image. And the three Hebrew children, you know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that was their Babylonian names. It was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were their Hebrew names. When they were taken captive, their names were changed. But they said, we will not bow down before that image. O King Nebuchadnezzar, it doesn't matter what you do to us. You go ahead and do it. We are not going to compromise our faith and bow down to that image. And so what happened? He said, I'm going to burn you in the fiery furnace. And he heated that the fiery furnace be heated up more than it ever had before. And he threw them in. And what happened to them? No harm came to them. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fire, there weren't three in there. There were four. Because the Lord had joined them in the fire. That's the way it always is. Whatever fire and trial we are going through in our life, we are not alone in it. God is with us. Fear not, for I am with you, he said. And they came out of the furnace unscathed. In Acts chapter 12... Uh, James had been arrested, beheaded, and Herod saw how much that, that pleased the Jews. And so he arrested Peter, intending to do the same thing in Acts chapter 12. But as Peter slept that night, an angel came and, as Peter did what? Slept. The next day, he's going to have his head cut off. But Peter slept. How much more different is the faith of this man than the one who was in the boat in the storm? Not too long before that. When he was scared out of his mind as the Lord slept. But now, Peter's learned the lesson, you see, to turn it all over to God. Don't don't worry about it. It's all in God's hands and your worrying does nothing anyway. And Peter was asleep the night before his execution in jail. But an angel of the Lord came and shook him and woke him up and said, hey, let's get out of here. And Peter walked out. I mean, so shocked were the people that were praying for his deliverance that when the servant girl went down and opened the door and saw him there, she shut the door and ran back upstairs. She left him standing there. Peter's down there and they said, no, no, it must be a ghost. It must be his ghost. I mean, here they are praying for his release. But so small our faith tends to be that when even God answers our prayers, we find it hard to believe sometimes. Because we are such fickle creatures of worry and doubt. Victories that God gave over and over that were against seemingly insurmountable odds. But our God is ready And willing to fight for us. Listen, we have nothing to fear. Seriously. Nothing to fear. If only we will let him. There's a heading missing here on the outline. It's God's victories. And we looked at all of these. But I want you to see that these were victories that the people received. A whole lot of times in our lives, we reject the victory. God wants to give us the victory. But because of our fear and our worry and our doubt, we reject his victory that he wants to give. A famous example of this is in the book of Numbers. You know what happens here in the book of Numbers? They've been wandering for 40 days as they left Egypt and they were coming up, coming up to the promised land that God wanted to lead them into. They stopped on the border and they said, let's send in spies. 
One from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so 12 spies go into the land. And what do they see? What's that? Giants. Giants. Of course you bring out the doubt first. They see a land flowing with milk and honey with fruit bigger than they've ever seen before. Oh, and yeah, also giants. You see what we focus on? Our tendency as human beings is to focus on the negative rather than the positive. That's exactly what happened with the spies. I, I'm not making fun of you, brother. Over, I knew that was going to be the answer. Because we know that that's what stopped them from going in, right? It was their fear of the giants. I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13. Let's see the report as they bring it back. We'll start reading with uh, verse 26. God led them to the land of promise. They were right there on the border, right on the cusp. They sent in the spies and the spies come back. Numbers chapter 13. Let's start reading with verse 26. I'm reading from the New King James. It says, Now they departed and they came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, that is Moses, and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. This land is inhabited. I mean, it has giants, and it also has all these other civilizations of people who live in this land. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession. For we're able to overcome it. See, that's the response of faith. Bring it on. Because Caleb thought he was strong. No, no, no. Because of the Lord, we shall see. Verse 31. The men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw giants, the descendants of Anak, uh, who come from the giants, and we are like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. And so then the people complained and they wailed and they said it would have been better if we had just stayed in Egypt and died there in slavery than to come out here for all of this. Joshua gives his report. Numbers chapter 14, starting with verse 6. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land... We pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. The spies returned with a fear filled report about giants who were huge and other people in the land who dwelled in fortified cities. Caleb and Joshua were the only ones who trusted God and said, He's brought it, he's brought us here, and He'll bring us through it. He will give us this victory. The rest of the spies and all the people rebelled against God and Moses. And in this instance, it cost them time. Their worry and their fear cost them the victory that God wanted to give them. And it cost them time. Forty more years. 
these people now had to wander throughout the wilderness. For most of them, it was the rest of their life that they wandered and never received the blessing that God wanted to give them. Instead of following God in faith, the people allowed the fear of tomorrow to rob them of the joy that God wanted to give them. It robbed them of the promises. It robbed them of the victory. And again, for most of them, it meant they lived the rest of their life with that failure on their hands and in their mind. How was God going going to give them this land? Uh, We know he was. How was he going to do it? I mean, the story could have been so much different, right? It could have been a story of victory and triumph as God calls the enemies to fight against each other. Or as somehow God struck them dead before they even had to strike a blow. I mean, the story could have been very similar to all of those other stories of God's victories, of the the victory that the people received. But it didn't turn out that way. It wasn't a story of joy and victory and triumph. Because of their fear and their worry, it's a sad and sobering story. And I have to stop and wonder, how often does the same thing happen in my life? How often have I rejected the victory that God was going to give me? How often have I rejected the blessing without standing in faith, realizing that he had already won? We have the story of the whole scriptures, right? We know how this story ends that we're living. We know every one of us are going to die, but we also know what happens after that. We know that that death is not the end. We know that God has already given us the victory. There's some little details to be worked out between here and there, but the there is we're going to live forever in eternity in God's glory. A glory that he's going to reveal not just to us, but in us, Paul says in Romans chapter 8. So what's the verdict of your own life then? Do you understand God's value in you? Do you understand God's power? Do you understand that he wants to give you a victory and in fact that the final victory is already won? So what's the verdict in your own life? What's it going to be? Are you going to trust God and the value that he places upon you? Are you going to trust God to bring about the victory no matter what the circumstances look like to you? I referenced a study on worrying last week that's found in Pastor R.B.'s R.B. Shiflett's commentary on the book of Philippians and the passage that we were looking at last week in verses 6 and 7 about worry. I looked up another study. This is a study that was done in July of 2019. A doctor there did a study where he asked patients to log what weighed on their minds, things that they were worrying about. Every night before they went to bed, they were to write down the things that they were worrying about. And he asked them to do this for 20 days, almost three weeks, just a day short of three weeks. He asked them to do this, and then he went back and he reviewed that with his patients. And it was eye-opening. At the conclusion of the 20 days of them recording their worries, a whopping 91.4% of everything that the people worried about never happened. Never came to pass. 91.4% of everything they worried about was a complete waste of their time and energy. That's why the Lord said, don't worry about tomorrow. Are you feeling paralyzed? By the potential for trouble that might happen in the future? Stop. This fear, you see, is robbing you of the victory that God wants to win for you in your life. It's stealing your time and crushing your joy. As people of God, we are called to walk and live by faith. We are called to trust God even in the face of fear and danger. And don't worry about tomorrow. That's in God's hands. Leave tomorrow in God's hands. 
Today is our responsibility. Today. Just be faithful today. Just trust God today. This day, that's it. Just this day. Trust God. And then tomorrow, do the same thing. Just for that day. Just trust God for one day. That day. And leave the future in His hands. Worrying about tomorrow is just going to suck the joy out of your life. The Lord said, this day has enough trouble of its own. Place all your fears and concerns about the future in God's hands. Make it a habit. We talked about it this last week. That's what we were going to do, right? That was our assignment. Anytime we were worrying about things, instead of continuing to worry about it and get all worked up about it, go to God in prayer. That's what we need to continue to do. Every day. And more importantly, not only will we be able to put this fear behind us and experience the peace of God, but more importantly, I think we'll begin to distance ourselves from that kind of fear. I think we'll fall into that trap less often if we make it a habit to trust in God and experience the peace that He has for us. Listen, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Every week now I've brought up this verse. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. God says that he is, Paul says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or even think. That's in God's word. The question for you this morning is do you believe it? Listen, do you really believe it? Is this the testimony of your life? That you believe that the God you serve is able to do this? Abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. Before we dismiss this morning, I want us to imagine just for a moment how different the story could have been. How different it could have been for the history of the Israelite people if when they came to the border of the promised land that they trusted God instead of letting fear get the best of them and worry about what was going to happen in the future if they went into the land. What if the 12 spies returned from the promised land and then the people said a prayer to God that went something like this. Father in heaven, we thank you for fully freeing us from the slavery that we were enduring in Egypt. We thank you for providing for us for these past 40 days in the desert. We thank you, Father, for bringing us here to the very edge of what you have promised for us. But, Lord, we see giants living in this land. They're big. They're strong. Our enemies have cities that appear impenetrable to us, and we're scared. God, it's hard to see how we might be able to defeat enemies such as these. But we know that you can do anything. We saw you work for us in the past. We watched as you destroyed the armies of Pharaoh before us. And we trust that you can do this as well. Lead us into tomorrow as we follow your plan. Calm our fearful fearful hearts and deliver us into this land which you have promised for us. Amen. How different would that story be? How different would our lives be if we prayed similar prayers? God, I see what's before me and I'm scared, but I trust in you fully and completely. You've led me here. I know you will lead me through. And let's just be faithful for today, just this day. Just one day. One day at a time. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. For this time that we've had once more to look into your word. Lord, help us with our fears and our doubts, our insecurities as we look to the future. Help us, Father, to just be present in the day that we're living. Give us the strength to be faithful, to trust in you fully. We know, Father, that you love us, you care for us. You are a God of great and awesome power who is able to provide for our every need, today, tomorrow, always, and forever. We just thank you in advance, Heavenly Father, for the victory which you've already secured on our behalf. 
It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this prayer and we give you all the praise. Amen.